Our next topic will be on flight data monitoring analytics. And with us today is Rob Holiday, Flight Safety Manager at L3 Harris, who's joining us from the UK. Rob, over to you. So good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're having a good safety summit. And uh, I'd like to talk to you today, as Jeff said, about uh, flight data analytics. There we go. Hopefully you can see my screen now. So uh, I'm going to run through briefly what, what flight data monitoring is. And then I'm going to talk a quite a bit about why we do it. If we understand why we do it, then we can get the best out of it. And then go through how to do it and some five reasons why, what makes a really effective flight data monitoring program. So what is flight data monitoring? Well, there are plenty of definitions out there. This one's from EASA. And for me, the key word here is proactive because we are able to monitor the application of st and standard operating procedures then um, and, and see how the aircraft's being operated. We're able to correct any shortcomings and therefore improve the operation continuously. So why do it? Well, the most obvious answers to that are safety and compliance. And really, if you're operating an airplane that's got a maximum takeoff weight above 27,000 kilos, and that ICAO standard has been incorporated into your local regulations, then you have to do it. And safety is often a word that means different things to different people and we pretty much have generally safe operations. So it's it's a very difficult one to, to, to hang your hat on, but there's some interesting comments there in the left-hand box. But the one that really stands out for me is is the uh, the comment from the, the Cessna Jet Pilots Owner Association. And these, it's so, so often the case that people think, well, the pilots don't really like flight data monitoring because they're being watched in the flight day. This is, a, this is a group of pilots that are really pushing for flight data monitoring and, and the, the, the Cessna family of aircraft are often the ones below the 27 tonne limit. And so they're, in, they're encouraging um, owners and operators of aircraft in that category to actually introduce flight data monitoring. Sorry, my slides are jumping around a little bit. So that's the safety and compliance issues. But really what we're trying to do, as Robert Sumwell put it, is find out what's behind the hangar door. And Robert wrote an article this year for Business Aviation Advisor. And here's a little section of it, which has been uh, recorded by an actor. When I was growing up, my dad was executive VP and partner in a commercial construction company. In the late 1960s, as their business expanded throughout the Southeast, they did what many smart organizations do. They purchased a twin engine airplane and hired a pilot. When I was around 13, dad took me along on a business trip where he was able to visit job sites in three cities in one day. We were back home in time for dinner. In flight, while I was pretending to be the co-pilot, dad sat in the passenger cabin and dictated notes for each job. Dad always told me how much he loved being able to be so efficient with the company plane. And he always spoke so highly of the pilot. However, that changed on a cloudy morning in 1976 when my parents and another couple were traveling to a convention. While an approach to a foggy runway, the plane descended below the authorized altitude while still in the clouds, careened into trees and caught fire. Looking at the pictures of the wreckage, even to this day, I am amazed and thankful that they were all able to get out with only minor injuries. The aircraft was destroyed completely. 
In the days following the crash, it was discovered that the pilot had not completed a recent flight review as required by the federal aviation regulations. When the aircraft was purchased, the sale was never recorded with the FAA, a violation of FAA requirements. There was no operations manual. There really was no true oversight over the operations and maintenance of the airplane. Yes, the airplane was shiny and glitzy. The pilot always appeared professional and he made good landings. He could almost always get passengers to their destination, but as demonstrated by this crash and many others, those aren't the best metrics of a safe operation. In fact, after being involved with several accident investigations over the years, looking back at this one, I've wondered, do many business aviation owners really know what's behind their hangar door? Do you know? So Robert asked a very important question there. Do you know? Do you know what's behind the hangar door? And that's what flight data monitoring can offer you. And since we're talking about data, let's have a look at some of the data. In the IATA safety report published in April this year for commercial operations in 2019, aircraft that were not mandated in an FDM program made up 40% of the accidents. In the Aviation Safety Network database, which is supported by the Flight Safety Foundation, in 2019, 63% of the accidents were below the mandated limit. Now this database is not just commercial flights, it includes private flights, uh, which are also uh, not mandated for flight data monitoring. But if we look a little bit deeper into that data for 2019, 95% uh, of 2019 business jet accidents were to aircraft below the 27 ton mandated limit, which is a pretty striking number. So let's have a look at an, an example of one of these one of these flights to an aircraft below that weight limit where FDM would have prevented the accident. This happened in the UK in 2015 at Blackbush Airport in Surrey. It was a single pilot operation. There were three passengers, but the aircraft was destroyed and the accident was fatal for everybody. Just to give you a little bit of a, a briefing before we show the animation, this is the track of the aircraft approaching from the south, flying overhead the airfield and joining a left-hand circuit, and then Operating inside and below the jet was a microlight fly, flying a circuit. And that microlight caused several TCAS alerts. And then operating uh, in transit through the area to the east, uh, shown by the green line there, was a light aircraft that was above the jet. And that also caused some TCAS events. So I'm going to run the animation now.
so the interesting thing about this uh, investigation was that the AAIB discovered when they looked at the flight data that had been recorded on the aircraft that the pilot had done it before on an approach to Jeddah. The operator didn't know anything about it because they weren't running a flight data monitoring program on this aircraft. They had other aircraft in their fleet which were of the higher weight category which they were uh, covering uh, with flight data monitoring but not this one and so the opportunity to debrief the pilot on a very similar approach with a high rate of descent towards warnings crossing the threshold at 150 knots flaps still extending as the aircraft touched down was missed and what made a difference uh, obviously in that case he got away with it but what made a difference in this case same scenario but as you saw towards the end of the flight with all of those oral warnings the confusing um, TCAS climb descend saturated his mental capacity and then removed the ability to maintain that situational awareness and realize that whilst attempting to complete the approach to the runway the runway was in fact much shorter and and uh, probably at least a third shorter than the runway in Jeddah and, and, and that point with that mental, that fixation and that mental saturation was the, the critical factor which meant that, that this, this time it ended in an accident. And so that's what flight data monitoring can do. You could, you could see something in advance and apply the debriefing and the possible uh, training to prevent it happening again. As a result of that, before the investigation was finished, before any report was published, the operator immediately implemented flight data monitoring. Um, and we have a, a saying in England for that, which is it's closing the stable door after the horse has bolted. But we also say it better late than never. But it's a really important point. They learned the lesson the hard way. But I'm sure you all have in your fleets, you have a mixed fleet above and below the mandated weight for flight data monitoring. And there's a really, really persuasive argument for including all of those in your, your flight data monitoring program. So summarizing, why, why do we need to do flight data monitoring? Well, safety, as I mentioned, it means different things to different people and not everybody buys that argument. Yes, sometimes you have to comply with the regulations, but as we've seen with multiple uh, accident recommendations, the regulations really don't go far enough. The data shows 95% of 2019 business jet accidents were to aircraft that weren't in a, a flight data monitoring program. There are some financial benefits, potentially uh, you can renegotiate your insurance premiums if you have uh, the aircraft in, a, in an F a safety program like FDM. And there's always the benefit that if you, the operation of the aircraft has been monitored in such a way that improves the resale value. From the maintenance point of view, detecting exceedances and uh, ensuring that the proper inspections are done is a bonus. But really the important stuff is the learning and the operational insights that you get to be able to be proactive and continuously improve your operation and to prevent serious incidents and accidents. And of course, if you don't know what's behind the hangar door, as Robert somewhat put it, you just can't manage what you don't know. And I'll leave that the why now with a very strong statement from the Flight Safety Foundation about what the absence of an FDM program could be construed by society as a failure to implement industry best practice. So with all those strong arguments about why you should do it and not just to comply with the regulations, but it is, that's uh, a good thing to do. Let's talk about how we do it. There are a couple of options. You can do it in-house. You can buy the computers, pay the software licenses, document all your procedures, employ staff, or as we do at L3 Harris, we provide a third party solution. So you can outsource that at sort of three levels. You could just have the data processed, you could have in-depth event analysis to go with that, or you can outsource the whole lot and have the, the, the entire program outsourced and just have the analysis of the data presented back to you in a series of reports and presentations 
for you to take the necessary action. If you're going to have a flight data monitoring program, then you need a policy. And a policy is really, how do we do this, that? How do we do each element of the flight data monitoring program? And I've listed them all here, and I don't have time in this presentation to go through each one, but I will, uh, I'll leave that with you. But the policy should at least, at the least cover all of those points. The second element is, once you know what's going on in your operation, what do you do about it? That's the risk management piece. That's where I see the, the biggest misunderstanding about events. And we're gonna talk about a couple of events later on that I'll explain what I mean by that. Very often, what you see on flight data monitoring is not, you don't see a great deal of very serious events, but you see minor exceedances you see SOP non-compliances, but they all have an importance as I'll show you later. If you have uh, air safety reports from your pilots or MORs, then the flight data is a great way of filling in the gaps and understanding what happened in those events and completing the investigation. You can develop trends and safety performance indicators from the data. You can, as we've mentioned before, monitor your standard operating procedures and as training of pilots moves away from performance-based training into pilot competencies and behaviors, you can actually start to link some of the data to those competencies and behaviors for the benefit of learning and debriefing. We talked about maintenance. Let's have a look now at the severity, probability and benchmarking of the data in your program. So what you're probably used to is uh, looking at level exceedances. So you have a particular event. This case, we're talking about rate of climb at 1,000 feet before level off. And as you probably know, as business, business jet operators, this is probably your most frequent event because those airplanes have really have very, very good performance. And you'll see marked on this, this chart a green, amber, and a red line. Those are the three levels of exceedance um, for this particular event. Now, if you, if you see the red line, which we call a level three event, and you're triggering level three events, what you don't know is by how much. So how severe is the exceedance? And this, this chart generated from our system is a, a distribution of the key data points from that uh, from that data. So here you can see that the events occurring above the level three threshold are actually going up to, in some cases, over 4,500 feet a minute rate of climb. So you can see that the level of exceedance is actually going, is actually quite quite severe in this case. So that's a really interesting way of understanding. Well, am I just pipping over that level three threshold by you know, 50 feet a minute, 100 feet a minute? No, in this case, actually, we're going over it quite a bit. So we may need to think about doing something about that. <clears throat> and then the dotted gray line is the distribution for other operators of similar equipment. So now what you're able to do on this chart is to see how you're performing against the rest of the industry that are operating those um, those types of aircraft. And as you can see, that gray line, once you go over that level three threshold is actually below the, the level of exceedance of this particular operator. And we, uh, at L3 Harris, we process the, the data for IATA's FDX flight data sharing program, if you've heard of that. And, uh, and so you, you're looking at there, you're looking at a very big basket of global operators of similar equipment. And if you're if you're not a member of that program, you, you can join it. You don't have to be an IATA member. It doesn't cost anything. IATA are very happy to, to get as much data as possible into that so that you get the, the best picture of, of what's going on. So that's something to consider. The 
The next element of a flight data monitoring program is communication and promotion. And this, I always think, is, is probably the most important part of, of a flight data monitoring program. You've got to get the message out there to the pilots. Pilots are part of the solution. They often feel they're being watched and that they're part of the problem. That's not the case. And so it's very important to tell them about flight data monitoring and tell them again. Don't just tell them once, keep reminding them and use all the means available to you, publications, reports, videos, crew room visits, intranet, email, whatever mediums you've got available. <coughs> Excuse me, if you can squeeze some time into their uh, six monthly tech refresher ground school training, that's great. And where, when you have a positive story to say about how FDM has improved the operation, share it with them so that they understand that this isn't about trying to catch people out. This is about continuous improvement. If you have pilot unions or staff associations, that's a great way to a great place to start. And always have an open open door policy for them to be able to review animations of their own uh, their own flights. Uh, in fact, in our system, we can automatically send them a link so they can look at the, look at their own data, look at their own animations, which is a very useful tool. So let's talk about compliance with standard operating procedures and pilot performance. Non-adherence to standard operating procedures was a primary contributing factor in 32% of accidents in the five years between 2015 and 2019. And that's from the IATA safety report. Now that's a pretty significant number. And by primary contributing factor, what I mean is that if they had adhered to standard operating procedures, the classification of that accident assessed that it in almost certainly would have been prevented. That's a pretty strong number. And then in terms of performance, how do we link flight data into those competencies and behaviors that I mentioned? So an example of an accident from uh, non-adherence to standard operating procedures was the uh, 2017 Learjet accident in Teterborough and the NTSB put one of the probable causes as non-compliance. And not for the first time, the NTSB recommended that part 135 operators should have an FDM program to identify procedural and non-compliances. So let's have a look at one for real. This is a noise abatement departure procedure. The, proced the process or the procedure is to maintain V2 plus 20 to 3000 feet before accelerating and retracting the flaps. So I've got a couple of animations here that I'll run uh, in parallel so that you can see the compliant one and the non-compliant one. And the animation tool is great for this. So uh, I'll run those now and you can, you'll see that uh, the top aircraft completely complies with the procedure and the one below just accelerates and cleans up straight away. Oops, let me get this to perform. There we go.
So the uh, the lower animation, the aircraft, the flaps are attracted now, and the aircraft's doing 190 knots already. Whereas the uh, the animation at the top there, you can see that the aircraft's maintaining uh, just over 150 knots and up to the almost up to the 20 degree pitch limit. And you can see from the uh, terrain behind the aircraft there that they're approximately in the same same position on the departure, and the aircraft that's adhered to the procedure is. Uh, 550 feet higher than the one that didn't follow the procedure. And you, you might uh, you might say, well, it's only a noise abatement departure procedure. The aircraft has good performance, probably didn't trigger any noise noise uh, monitoring points. But really, that's that's not the point. Now you know something. It's happening here, what are you gonna do about it? And it's that big question, now we know, what are we gonna do? And the real question to ask is, if that crew don't apply that standard operating procedure to follow that noise abatement departure procedure, what else are they doing that isn't, that is non-SOP? So I think it's important to talk to the crew, feedback the information, encourage them to, to follow those standard operating procedures. And the animation tool is a very powerful uh, way of doing that. And another thing to think about is which one, if you were going to get this message out across all of your pilots, which animation would you show them? Would you show them the one that was non-compliant and say, don't do that? Or would you show them the one that was fully compliant and say, do it like that? For me, I quite often think that the most positive message is to show the compliant one and say, this is how we want you to do it. And not only that, but it proves that it's completely possible, it's not difficult and it can be done. And so I think that's a, an interesting way to think about how you get your messaging out when, you, when you're providing this, this type of feedback. So let's have a look at competencies and behaviors. And I mentioned before, certainly the, the trainers in our, in our commercial training section are now, this is all they're talking about now is moving away from performance-based training into identifying competencies and behaviors. And this example is uh, an aircraft that's descending to flight level 130. It's passing flight level uh, 270. The aircraft exceeds VMO by two knots. The pilot disconnects the auto throttle and reduces uh, thrust and speed. There's no maintenance action required. What do you do? It's a minor exceedance with no further action. Or is there something more to be learned from this? Now, I've, I've seen these closed, no maintenance action required, closed, bang. But let's have, if we have a little closer look at it, Let's have a look at what the PF and the PM were doing and go back through it and find out why this happened. So the pilot flying has the autopilot and the auto throttle engaged. The vertical mode is in vertical speed and the speed mode is in Mach. In passing 280, the speed mode doesn't change from Mach to indicated airspeed. And so the auto throttle gradually increases to maintain the Mach and to maintain the vertical speed and of course, the consequence of that is that the indicated airspeed increases until VMO is exceeded. And the pilot monitoring, what's the pilot monitoring doing? What should they be doing? So here it is on a, on a chart. This is generated from our system. It might look a little bit, uh, a little bit overwhelming, but you can build this up slowly by dragging and dropping all of these, these little uh, data points onto it. Um, the purple line across the top means the autopilot was engaged throughout. The light green line here that runs, and then there's a break in the light green line, that's the auto throttle, and the gap is where it was disengaged at the moment of the exceedance. This uh, little pink line that, that changes with, with altitude is the MMO that's changing as the aircraft descends. And this, this line here, this uh, red line is the altitude, the aircraft descending. And then uh, what we can see here is this dark blue line 
is the airspeed increasing as the aircraft descends. And the little squiggle here is because uh, at this point, uh, the crew got right up to MMO before they realized that MMO was actually uh, changing as they descended and they reduced MMO. So, but you can see that as they, they made a couple of reductions in, in the, uh, the MAC target rather, um, they, um, the airspeed followed it. But ultimately when they were set uh, at the uh, selected MAC, the airspeed just continually increased until it broke through this light blue line which is VMO, at that moment, the auto throttle was disengaged and the speed you can see rapidly reduced. So that's a graphical display. If you like spreadsheets, we can show you on the, all the numbers against these times are, uh, I've set this to four seconds apart. So each data point is four seconds apart, but you can change that to a quarter of a second or one second or whatever your preference is. And you can see the same, uh, information but in a different uh, different format but ultimately what we're after doing here is we don't want to say yeah it was just a two knot exceedance the crew responded bang nothing to see here we want to look at it from the perspective of these competencies and behaviors and these are the nine ICAO competencies listed here and the one that I've chosen for the pilot flying is airplane flight management automation the automation was in, the problem was it wasn't being managed properly and in vertical speed mode you've got to change Mac to indicated airspeed at around 280-ish um, in the descent and that didn't happen so it was a mismanagement of the automation and from the my slide changing is having fun today so from the pilot monitoring's point of view the situational awareness and the management of the information, the monitoring, all those monitoring behaviors that are listed there as a subset of this competency, they broke down as well, clearly not monitoring what was happening. And then if you don't see it, then the communication to the pilot flying that, that something needs to be done didn't happen. And what's great about identifying these competencies and behaviors is these don't apply just to this scenario. These competences and behaviours apply to almost all aspects of operating the aircraft. And so if you were to take this small two knot exceedance of VMO and then talk to that crew or all of you, it depends if you want to talk to that crew individually or train these competence and behaviours across all of your pilots, you know, without ever anybody knowing who was involved in that particular event, then these competence and behaviours apply to all aspects of the operation. And you're not just improving speed control you're improving the operation as a whole and that's the great benefit of looking at it in this particular way so what makes a good flight data monitoring program and i've these are my these are my five whys these are five reasons why a flight data monitoring program for me is really effective number one is trust you have a recording of somebody's day at work, what they've done at work that day. They have to trust you with it. No question about that. Transparency is the second one. It kind of goes in hand with, with uh, all of them. But if, if to trust you, they need to know who you are and how you manage their, their data. So transparency of the system is absolutely crucial. Communication is next on the list. Tell them what you do, tell them how you do it, absolutely vital. And that goes hand in hand with integrity. So you can say what you do, but you have to do what you say, no exceptions, integrity is hugely important. And lastly, engagement. It's the pilot's data, get them involved, show them that it's a good thing, show them the benefits of it, show them it's them there for them, let them see their own data, let them see their animations, let them learn from their operations. And those five things are what I've seen that make up a really effective flight data monitoring program. And with that, I will say thank you for your time and hand back to Jeff. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Rob, <coughs> for intriguing presentations. 
we'll uh, hold for a minute uh, for any questions. We still have a little bit of time, so uh, oh, we may have a question coming in now. Uh, what is the most common pilot exceedance? Um, in business jet operations, vertical speed closely followed by speed. Uh, and that's a little bit the nature of the fact that the airplanes are very powerful. They've got a high power to weight ratio. They generally don't do derated takeoffs. Um, and yeah, so that's that's what we see. We see uh, we see high vertical speed and high speed. And interestingly enough, in that accident animation that I showed you, those were two uh, two of the two of the elements that were uh, certainly uh, out of kilter on that particular approach. So yes, those those are the most common pilot exceedances. What, what's quite interesting around, around that is that when you talk to operators, they, some of them say, look, you know, the airplane climbs really well. We don't want our pilots fiddling around, changing vertical modes close to the level off. The autopilots are so good, they'll level off. We're prepared to, if the pilots are in busy airspace and there's potential for a closure rate TCAT, then yes, they could potentially intervene and, and reduce the, the rate of climb. Otherwise, we're happy to let the autopilot do it. So that's quite interesting. Um, yeah, so, and, and others others have a policy where they want the pilots to, to change modes and reduce vertical speeds. So there's quite a difference in the way that, that people handle that. As a follow-up to the first question, in what phase of flight are the errors seen in most um, well, I think you probably see the, the high speed events are on departure and on approach. Um, the rate of climb issues are usually in the mid levels, um, between five and 20,000, um, feet. Uh, but again, it depends a little bit on the aircraft weight and the, the, uh, the type of airspace, the complexity of the, uh, SID. Uh, and so on. So um, yeah, but but yeah, that's that's where where you see the the mo most of the speed events are on departure and on arrival. Could F FDAP be used to assess pilots' over reliance on automation? Um, yes, absolutely could. In fact, um, if if you have a uh, a policy for when your pilots can you fly the airplane manually. Um, you could you could monitor to see if they're applying that policy. So, for example, in in those um, those two noise abatement departure procedures that that we looked at, one of the pilots engaged the automation and the other didn't. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting because it was um, it was in one of the London airports. It's very busy airspace with this complicated SIDs and and um, transition altitudes and and the uh, the Heathrow departures cross over the top so it can get quite busy there and and so that you could say what if your policy is that in in busy airspace like that you should use the automation and why why didn't the, the pilot that didn't use it why didn't they use it and conversely you could say um, uh, at a quiet airfield in quiet airspace where there's an opportunity to, to, to hand fly the aircraft, you, you could monitor that. What, what we're also doing is we're putting FDAP into our simulators so that we can start comparing what 
pilots do during their um, six monthly refreshes and uh, with with what they're doing online and build a whole picture for them so that they can they can work on their weaknesses, monitor their own performance and continuously improve. Uh, 1000 feet policy, uh, stabilized policy in IMC 500 in VMC. How do you know if the weather at the moment is VMC or IMC? Well, um, interesting, in that accident at Blackbush that we, we looked at the animation, that company had a 200 feet uh, VMC stabilization height and they immediately raised it to 500 feet after that accident. Um, so how do we know? Okay, so when, when, um, when you look at the flight in our system, it has the, it, it's connected to a database of METARs so that um, you can see on the same page as the flight details before you go into that graphical section that I showed you, um, it, the, the METAR for the time of that approach is there. So you can, you can straight away see whether or not they were clear of cloud and visibility more than five kilometers to as, ascertain if it was a VMC approach um, and, uh, or, or an IMC approach. So if the, if the system triggers an unstable approach at 1000 feet, um, oh, sorry, if, if the system triggers an unstable approach uh, between uh, 1000 and 500 feet, you can look at the meta, you can say that was VMC, uh, they were stable at 500 feet, and then you, um, we have a button called uh, an operator's invalid button. And so you just click that button and you say this is, this is an invalid event because it was VMC. Um, so that has to be done manually, but the weather is there on the, obviously the computer doesn't, um, can't interpret that, That's, that has to be a human function at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. All uh, right. Uh, with no further questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you again, Rob, very much for a uh, very insightful uh, discussion and presentation. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.